Welcome to another edition of You and Me and Multiple Sclerosis. My name is Pam and I've been living with multiple sclerosis for 37 years. And as always, I'd like to share some of my thoughts and experiences with you today. Well, if you follow classical music at all, you probably already know who I'm going to be talking about today. A young woman by the name of Jacqueline Dupre, known as not just the best young cellist, not just the best woman cellist, not just the best British cellist, but one of the greatest cellists ever. She played the cello from an early age. She started at age four, and her mom, who was trained as a classical pianist, found her the right tutors encouraged her to practice, and opened up all kinds of opportunities for her. She had an amazing career, and because she was British, that it was particularly noteworthy that one of her signature pieces was from Edward Elgar, who was a British composer and did a concerto for the cello that she performed as pretty much a signature piece, and in fact, the recording, which I highly urge you to get, still very much available today. And I, of course, would not even be talking about her except that she developed multiple sclerosis. It's a good thing that she was very precocious, right, and started out from age four playing the cello, and by the time she was in her early 20s, she was world-renowned because multiple sclerosis came on we don't know quite when it started, but certainly by age 28, she'd been officially diagnosed and her symptoms were interfering with her ability to play. She didn't have the dexterity in her fingers or the strength in her arms. And as you can probably guess, you'd need that for a great big instrument like the cello. But even any instrument, it's difficult to play if you don't have fine motor skills. And she was losing those very quickly. They don't say, but I have to guess that it must have been a primary progressive form of MS because when the symptoms got going, there were no remissions. She just got worse and worse, and she died at the young age of 42. But her career had long been over by then. Nonetheless, she'll always be remembered as one of the greatest cellists ever with a very distinctive style of playing. There are a number of biographies of Ms. Dupre, and I would encourage you to look at those because each biography, of course, is going to focus on something slightly different. The one that I read through, it's this one here. I will put the link down below, of course. It was written by her older sister and younger brother. The family was really, really close, and they all did many things together. The sister also was very musical, but even though the brother did not really bond much with music and found his passion in doing other things, they were still very close, all three of the kids, and as they grew, they remained close, and the mother and father, it was a very tight-knit family. And so when I read the title of this biography, it's called A Genius in the Family. And interestingly, the genius is not really the focus as much to me anyway, as I read this. The word family seems to be more of the focus because it's really the family dynamics that are interesting here, that are quite fascinating actually and gave me some good insights into not just Jacqueline Dupre's MS, but my own MS, because of the way that it affects her loved ones, the people closest to her. I think that because she was already known to be a genius from a very young age, the family had gotten into a habit of putting her first and, and making many, many sacrifices in their own lives, in their own priorities. Nothing but the best for Jackie, right? She had to have the opportunities. She had to have the lessons. She had to have the equipment, the instruments. But even beyond that, she needed a lot of emotional support. And her family was always there for her. 
because once she developed the MS symptoms, and certainly when they got so bad she wasn't able to continue to play, her needs for emotional support were, if anything, even more enormous. But because her family had already been in the habit of putting her first and making sacrifices for her, they just kind of segued from the genius musician persona to the person with MS persona. Their love for her never wavered. As time went on, some of her behavior was difficult, to say the least. I'd be interfering with your desire to go and read the book for yourself, so I won't give you a lot of spoiler kind of details, but I do want to say that her demands on her family didn't just border on the outrageous. I think a number of her demands were outrageous. Actually, if they hadn't already been used to loving her and making sacrifices for her and putting her needs before their own, I don't know how they would have been able to survive psychologically. It, it was very, very exhausting emotionally, very draining on the family. And as I think about my own MS, I think about my own changes as I've progressed in my MS. And I'm certainly not as progressed as Jacqueline Dupre. She was unable to take care of herself. By the end, she couldn't even feed herself. She had trouble swallowing. It was quite an effort just to maintain her. She lost her ability to speak, at least intelligibly, even though she could hear, certainly, and she understood things. But people would talk with her, but she couldn't really communicate back. And thankfully, the family, being so close to her, they kind of knew and understood much more than she was able to communicate verbally. She did marry. In fact, she married the famous conductor, Daniel Barenboim, but she never had any children, though she expressed the desire to have them and thought that she would. But quite clearly, by the time she was in her late 20s, that was no longer going to be an option for her. But I, I want to talk a little bit about the, the sacrifices that her family made for her, just in the terms of how unthinking we can be when we have a disability we tend to get very self-focused, or at least I have had moments where I've, I've been very self-focused and downright selfish, I have to say. You know, I kind of just want someone to take care of a certain thing or do a certain thing or not do a certain thing. And I have to stop myself short and remember, no, this is a human being that has their own goals and desires in life. They can't just be there for me 100% of the time. And, and I think that looking at her life, I see that there could even have been something like that happening with me. Just wanting my own way, wanting things to go my way, and wanting other people to kind of fall in line with that. <laughs> I know it sounds horribly selfish, and I don't even think of myself as a selfish person. I don't think that Jacqueline Dupre would have considered herself a, sel a selfish person either. But it just kind of happens and you fall into patterns. And like I said, her family was already in the mode of putting her first because of her musical genius. And so when she developed MS, they were just in the habit of that. But I think that I could have said the same almost for me because my husband is a, is a caretaking kind of guy. And when my MS progressed a little more and when I was unable to continue working for a living, as I had been doing, and when a number of the hobbies and, and interests that we had had to go by the wayside, uh, he, he didn't abandon me. And I know a lot of marriages flounder with MS. It's not, it's not easy on relationships. But as I said, it really appalled me some of the demands that she made on her family and some of the cruel things that she said as her MS progressed. And one has to wonder how much of that is a result of the disease itself, just making changes in your brain. And how much of it is just frustration because 
you have to be angry. Your life was one thing. You were on a trajectory, and now that's all lost to you, and you're so young. So it's probably a combination, but she was pretty outrageous with some of the things that she did. I keep saying that, and I'm not telling you what it is, but I want you to read the book for yourself, because I'm not going to make judgments for you. I'd rather have you do that. So there's a couple of things that I highly recommend. Number one, I will link the biography and read that. But before you read it, I hope you will listen to some of her music. She had an incredible talent, a talent that one could only really describe as a gift because it wasn't even just that she was technically skilled at the cello. She inhabited the music. She felt the music emotionally and she played it as she felt it, instead of just mastering the notes and the phrasing mechanically, like even some of the best musicians will do. She was a unique individual. She was loved all the way to the very end by everyone who knew her, even though she had not been able to be the person that they had known before. She was still someone who was very, very important to them. And that, too, is to, something to keep in mind for us as we progress in our MS or as we have bad days and we get to thinking, I'm not really much use in the world anymore, am I? Not compared to what I used to be. No, none of us should think that. I don't think that, and I hope you never do either. But her story, I hope, will maybe even inspire you. I don't know. But it, it will be of interest to you because you can relate to a lot of it. No matter how progressive your MS is, no matter how much disability you've accumulated in the years, you can understand what she's going through. Especially when you consider that this was all happening back in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s. And the sad thing is, MS is no more curable and in some ways no more treatable than it was back then. And people's thoughts about MS back then are not all that different from today, even though we have a lot more medicines uh, that have some promise. But what they thought about people with MS and what they thought their prognosis was really hasn't changed all that much. When we read about her, it's a lot easier to relate to what she's going through than <laughs> perhaps we might with just about any other medical condition. Well, thankfully, one thing that is different that we seem to have learned over the intervening years is the, the effect of stress on our MS symptoms. Her siblings had asked the doctors and also her husband whether they thought that perhaps the stress that she had from all of her performing obligations, her musical career, perhaps had had some effect on her MS. And, you know, at the time, both the doctors and her husband strenuously denied that stress has anything to do with multiple sclerosis. And we know better now. Well, we don't think there's a causal link. I don't think stress causes MS. We know from our own experience that if you're stressed, your MS symptoms can get worse, right? One thing that the husband had said was that how could she possibly be stressed? She loves performing. She loves to play the cello. She could play for hours. And he's probably right, but there's two points to that. Number one, even good stress is stress. And number two, there's more to a musical career than performing, right? You've got travel, you've got meeting with people, you've got parties, you've got long hours, you've got signing ceremonies, you've got awards banquets, you've got all kinds of other stuff. And that can be really wearing. And there are even hints in the book that she did find some aspects of her career exhausting. So I'm glad that at least now we know that MS is more than just a physical disease and that we need to be looking at other factors. I don't know if I made a lot of sense on this one, but I have been very affected by this book. If you do read it, I'd love to hear comments from you about it, what your thoughts were, how you saw her life 
whether you relate to any of what was going on. Anyway, leave me a comment below. Have a wonderful day, and I'll see you again in my next video.